Continuing with page three and our study of derivatives, partial derivatives, we're going to now estimate partial derivatives with a different kind of picture. This is a graph or a contour graph, but we can also estimate with this. So in the previous page, we estimated using the difference quotient and an equation. And here we're going to use a type of difference quotient, but with a graph, contour map. So I'm going to use the contour map to estimate f sub x at negative one, negative one and f sub y at the same point. So the first thing you want to do is go look at the graph at that point. So here's my x axis, here's my y axis, and they're labeled down here. So negative one for x and negative one for y is right there. So that's the point from which I'm referencing all my rates of change. Now if I want to estimate, remember these are estimates, so <clears throat> we, can't, we can't be wildly exact, but we can make some pretty good guesses based on the contour map. Okay, so when I'm at this point right here, it looks like my z value is approximately three, somewhere between two and four. So I'm going to estimate that I'm at negative one, negative one, three, right? And you know, if you think it's a little less, make it 2.9. If you think it's a little more, make it 3.1. I mean, you're again, you're, this is an estimate. It's like, yeah, it looks like this, and then you go with it. Now I know that f sub x is the partial of z with respect to x. So I'm going to make a small change in x and see how it makes a change in z. So I mean, I can go a little tiny crick here, uh, but generally when you have a contour map, you just go parallel to the x axis to the next contour. And then I have my output there as four. And then my output originally was three. And then my original x was minus one. And my new x is, well, it looks like, I mean, if I come down here, it looks like it's almost half, negative 0.5, maybe negative 0.6 if you're going to be picky. So I've moved from minus one to negative 0.6. So from 0.6 and minus one. So this ordered pair, when x is negative 0.6, I'm at z equal four, right? Negative 0.6 is equal four. When I'm at x equal negative one, I'm at three. So I should have an extra negative in there. So it's the difference in the z's over the difference in the x's with a small change, like right to the next contour. So this is going to give me, this is an approximation here. This is going to give me one divided by, now what's 0.6 plus one? I don't trust myself, man. 0.6 plus one, oh, negative 0.6 plus one gives me 0.4. And uh, let's see what that number is. One divided by 0.4 gives me 2.5. So I'm getting a slope in the x direction of about 2.5. Um, and that makes sense. It should be positive because when I move in the positive x direction, the z's are increasing. So that means my derivative should be positive. So let's do something similar for the y. So f sub y at negative one, negative one, again, is a change in z with respect to y. So now I'm going to start at the same point, but now I'm going to move upward parallel to the y-axis to the next contour. Yeah, and it's a little further away, but again, we're estimating. We can't make small changes because there's not enough information. So my change in z, uh, I, I ended at two, I started at three, so that's going to be two minus three. So my y value started at negative one and ended at zero. So I'm going to do zero minus negative one. If I simplify that, I get negative one divided by positive one, which gives me negative one slope. So does that make sense? Well, if I move parallel to the y-axis, the z values decrease. So that means my derivative should be negative. So that looks about right. Now, if you are awake listening to this, you'll notice that this probably is the equation of a plane, probably is the equation of a plane because there are parallel lines the z values are equal distance apart, and the uh, lines are equal distance apart. Not only parallel, but equal distance. So this is a plane. 
if you have, if you know you have a plane, I'm going to tell you if you have a plane. F sub X will always equal M and F sub Y will always equal N. That's only in the instance of a plane. So don't apply that everywhere. The key is you have to understand that a plane has to come first. <clears throat> All right. If you have any questions, make sure you ask them in class or on the discussion board. All right. Let's go for number four. This is a, <laughs> this is a wildly fun one because it's got so many units of measure here. You really have to know what you're talking about in order to do this one. So let's see, I want to do, I actually have a slightly typo. This should be partials here. All of these should be partials. All right, so I'm taking, I want to estimate the partial of Q with respect to I and the partial of Q with respect to P at this point. Now this is a notation that we talked about before with this kind of notation, but this actually is how you note that you're going to be at a point. You draw a vertical line and then you write the ordered pair where you're referencing from right next to it. It's cumbersome, but nevertheless, it's still legitimate. It's Isaac Newton's version of it. Now the point in question is when P is four and I is 40. So I'm going to come over here and circle that P is four P and I P is four. I is 40. So this is the point that everything is referencing from. Now, <clears throat> when we did a chart, if we had a chart of a function in Calc 1 and we did estimation of a derivative around a point, we use something called the central difference quotient. There's actually a variety of ways to do this, but the central difference quotient seems to be the most appropriate. So let's talk about the first one and then it, hopefully it will make sense. So if I do the partial of Q with respect to I at from the reference point P equal four, I equal 40. I'm going to do something similar as I've done before. I'm going to take the change in Q <clears throat> over the change in I near that point. So if I think now I is the thing that's changing. So I'm going to keep my P column fixed. So here's my point. I'm going to take the two numbers around it for my change in Q. So 19.88 minus 10.04. That's called the central difference quotient. It puts the number in question, the reference number in the center of the two numbers that you have here. Now it's not literally the, the mean, but on the chart, it's the number that's in the middle of the two. And I use the two when I estimate my derivative. Now, if that's changing, I have to think, okay, then 19, 0.88 compares with $60,000 income and 10.04 compares with $20,000 income. So that's going to be a pretty reasonable estimate. Now you can, again, you can go from one side and just do the change there or the other side and do the change there. It'll be pretty close, but this is surprisingly the most accurate. So let's see, let's calculate this. Uh, let's see clear. Let's do 19.88 minus 10.04 divided by 60 minus 20. Again, I'm just going to do it in one big shot. 0 0.246. Good. Now let's try DQDP from the same reference point, P equal four, I equal 40. So now when I look at the chart, I want to keep I fixed and then look at the change in P around that point. So if I use a central difference quotient again, my P changes from 17 point, I think that's a four, 17.46 minus 14.18. Those numbers are terrible to read, huh? And then I think about, okay, now how did the P change accordingly? At 17.6, my P was 4.5. And at 14.18, my P was at 3.5. So that's a pretty good estimate. So let's see, let's do the little calculator math with it. 17.46 
Now it's 14.18 divided by 4.5 minus 3.5. Oh, I see. I made a typo. Let's do that again. <laughs> Sorry. You probably saw that before I did. I need to put a decimal point right there. Okay, so insert a decimal point. I think that's right. So it gives me 3.28. Now that's great. Woohoo, I have these numbers. But how do those numbers, what do they mean in terms of price of beef, household income per year, and the amount a household spends on beef per week? So we want to actually interpret how we describe those two numbers. So let's start with this guy up here, 0 0.246. Whenever you do interpretations of rates of change, there are certain things that you always want to have included. So I'm going to put this guy over here, and I'll put this one under here. So the first thing you always want to talk about is your reference point. So you say when the price of beef is four dollars per pound with a household income of forty thousand dollars. Now this is where this can get a little tricky because you got so many units of measure here. So I always think about this when it got tricky stuff. I just think this is 2.246 over 1, where 1 stands for I and the numerator stands for Q. So you would say something like, for each $1,000 increase in salary. Now, where am I getting the $1,000? Well, that comes from the 1 down here. This is in, in terms of thousands of dollars. So this is, I'm changing this about $1,000. The amount of dollars spent per household each week now what I'm doing then is now taking into consideration that unit of measure. The amount of dollars increases by about technically 25 cents, but I'm going to write it in terms of dollars, 0 0.246 dollars. Now that's crazy. So <laughs> that's how it's interpreted though. That's the simplest way of doing this with all these units of measure. So first you talk about the reference. When the price of beef is four dollars, with a household income of forty thousand, because it's going to be different if I'm in a different spot. So always note the spot, and then you just talk about okay, if the dependent variable changes by one, how did the independent variable change? Oh, I said that backwards. When the independent variable changes by one, how does the dependent variable change? When the independent changes, how does the dependent? That's how you describe. So I say, all right, I'm going to change my Independent variable, $1,000, so that's $1,000 increase in salary. Then the amount of money that I spend on beef, the amount of dollars spent per household each week increases by about 2.46. Why does it increase? Because that's a positive number. Now let's do this guy here. It's going to be very similar. I'm going to start the exact same way. When the price of beef is, let's see if I can have as much paper as possible here. When the price of beef is four dollars per pound with a household income of forty thousand dollars. Now, again, I think about this as three point two eight over one, and I think about okay, the dependent variable. I'm sorry, I need to talk about how does the, if the independent variable changes by one, how does this change? The dependent variable. So I'm going to change my independent variable by one unit. 
that means that this is P, right? That's what's changing here, DP. So that means my price of beef is increasing by $1 per pound. For each $1 increase in price per pound, What can I say about 3.28? Well, then I say the amount of money spent on beef the amount of money spent on beef now I'm going to talk about increasing or decreasing since that's positive I'm going to increase increases three dollars and 28 cents <laughs> sorry my phone's going off um, per household per week so I have all the units of measure in there I have price dollar per pound I have dollars per household per week and I have the initial point described so there is that kind of crazy huh this is kind of a this is a harder one you see the early one where we interpreted it was a little bit easier this is a little bit harder but they do get challenging and just pay attention to your units of measure and the structure always reference the point that you're starting at and then talk about how things change when you leave it